My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I'm pleased to be able to host this Forest Connect webinar series. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Paul Curtis. Paul is, in this, is a, an associate professor in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell, where he serves as the state wildlife specialist and uh, works in a variety of different wildlife issues and spends a lot of time recently focusing on deer given the impacts that deer are having. So Paul has agreed to talk with us about the impacts of deer on northeastern forests and strategies for management. So with that, I'm going to mute my microphone. And Paul, you're all set to go. There's, if you need the pointer, remember the pointer's in the upper left-hand corner under the Quick Start button. So I will mute my microphone and hover here in the background. It's all yours. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you much, Pete. Um, good evening, everyone. I uh, appreciate you being on this webinar tonight. What I'd like to do today is talk about some background on uh, deer vegetation management, you know, particularly targeted woodland, and then in uh, sort of the second half of the presentation, talk about some strategies for management uh, that folks might consider uh, in their own woodlands or on their own property. So we'll go ahead and dive in. First of all, what makes a healthy forest? And a healthy forest should include a variety of native plant and tree species, and also the ability for a new forest to grow or regenerate if you have a disturbance, say a natural disturbance like an ice storm or a wind throw, or following a timber harvest. And there are a number of factors that are uh, impacting northeastern forests today, and we wanted to discuss those in some detail. In uh, 2010, the Nature Conservancy did a statewide assessment based on forest inventory data and looked at predicted regeneration of native tree canopy species in the state. And if you look overall, a lot of the state's in green and things don't look too bad. Uh, it looks like 68% of forest inventory plots were in good to very good condition, and only about a third were really in the poor, fair category, and most of those are in southeastern New York State, uh, lower Hudson Valley, and, and on the Long Island. But if you look in a little bit more detail and look at predicted regeneration of desirable timber species in New York State, things like oak, uh, sugar maple, ash, those type of, of valuable saw timber trees, then the picture is not near so bright. Only 43% of uh, forest inventory plots statewide had a good, a very good rating, and over half the sites across the state uh, were ranked either poor or fair. And you can see widespread problems across all of southern New York and even in the southern and central Adirondack regions when it comes to regeneration of desirable timber species. About that same time, uh, Pete, uh, Gary Goff, myself, and others at Cornell conducted a survey of professional uh, foresters in the field that were walking you know, thousands of acres of land each year and asked them uh, what percent of forest stands you looked at during the past year would fall in each category. And if you look at statewide statistics, uh, the likelihood of forest regeneration being moderately or highly successful across the state was only about 30%. Uh, about almost 5% were ranked marginally successful and a full quarter were ranked as a complete failure from a regeneration standpoint. So we asked that same group of uh, foresters, well, why? What's going on? What's causing the regeneration failure? And uh, the bottom line is that it's usually multiple factors at any given site. Uh, but if you had to rank the factors the highest, uh, number one with three quarters of stands were impacted by deer browsing, and half the stands were impacted by inter interfering vegetation, vegetation on a statewide basis. So again, these are uh, the two areas of biggest concern when it comes to uh, forest regeneration in, in New York and other northeastern states. For a, a hardwood re, uh, regeneration in the Northeast, you really got to do three things correctly. If any one of these goes wrong, your chance of successfully regenerating hardwoods is pretty slim. First, you've got to have correct silviculture applied to the floors. Uh, the type of cut, make sure that you've got enough light getting to the forest floor to stimulate regeneration. Then if there is existing understory competition, things like uh, uh, beach brush or hay scented fern, it may require herbicide or some other type of 
of uh, control in order to get the competition under control. And then the third and final thing, you've got to manage deer herbivory, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And there's a number of ways to do that, including fencing, hunting, slash cover, and we'll talk about all these and, and some other potential options. White-tailed deer are a keystone herbivore, and what that means is they've got the ability to change their own habitat and affect the habitat for other species. Another common example of a keystone uh, wildlife species would be something like the beaver with wetland creation. It really changes the, the system to a great extent and what other animals and plants can be there. So how do deer affect the forest? Well, the biggest thing is what we would say is missing layers of vegetation. If you're in a forest stand and it's a park-like setting where you can see 150, 200 yards through an open stand of hardwoods, that's not normal in the Northeast. And uh, there's something uh, going on there. Often it's a uh, deer herbivory is, is the cause of it. There have been numerous fencing studies done over the year. This photograph is from a publication out of Pennsylvania showing the impact of deer on regeneration in a forest ecosystem. On the left side, where deer are part of the equation, there's almost no brush or tree seedlings anywhere. Uh, the ground layer is dominated by, by ferns and grasses. On the right side, inside the fence where deer have been excluded, you get a, a, a thick dog hair thick stand of uh, seedling saplings, brush, and other species uh, that could potentially regenerate on that side if deer weren't part of the equation. Now, zero deer is just as unrealistic as way too many deer. Uh, our forest exhaust evolved with deer on the landscape. So the, the ideal setting would be somewhere in the middle uh, between these two photographs because we don't want to eliminate deer, but we want to uh, keep deer at a population at, at a level that's healthy for forests so we can uh, regenerate them and have good biodiversity. We know from a number of different studies that uh, deer have preference for different browse species, woody species in, in the system. And again, things like sugar maple, ash, aspen, oak, uh, yellow birch, and more of the north country are things that are high in palatability, and deer will select those species out. Whereas at the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got things like American beech or hornbeam, striped maple, uh, some of the pines and spruces, uh, those are very low preference species. And usually if you see damage on these low preference species, that's an indicator that uh, deer are overabundant in the woodland and impacting other uh, plants and animals. There was a study done at the Northeast Forest Experiment Station in northern uh, Pennsylvania by uh, Nancy Tilgman, Susan Stout, David D. Colasta, and others. And from 1979 to 1990, they created a, a series of large deer enclosures uh, where they stocked deer into a fenced area at a specific density to simulate 10 deer, 20 deer, 40 deer, and 80 deer per square mile. And then they looked at the impact of those different deer densities on uh, wildflower species diversity and riches. And not surprisingly, at the, the higher deer densities, uh, 40 and 80 uh, deer per square mile, some of the wildflower species disappeared. Things like Trillium, Canada Mayflower, Indian Cucumber, all very sensitive to deer browsing along with other plants in the system, but uh, these three species were, were heavily impacted by high deer density. And what's really interesting, uh, after that experiment was done and the fences were opened up so that you know deer could roam freely, uh, People came back in and looked at those same plots 15 years later and examined tree species diversity. And what they found, there was still a significant measurable effect of the impact of deer from a decade and a half of, of prior browsing. And so these are what we call legacy effects that and once an ecosystems impacted, if you, even if you re, could remove deer from the landscape, it takes a while for the system to recover. Could be many years, could be decades uh, for the system to completely recover once it, it's been over impacted by deer for a number of years. 
Deer also affect the forest by removing native plant species and creating open space and, and suitable habitat for invasive plants to come in. Things like garlic mustard on the left or Japanese barberry on the right uh, heavily impact some uh, wooded stands in parts of New York State. Uh, the barberry is particularly problematic because it contains shade and, and cool conditions that favor uh, high black-legged tick densities, and black-legged ticks are the, the ticks that carry Lyme disease. Another impact of these degraded ecosystem, uh, Rick Ostfeld from Carriar Arboretum has been studying rodent populations and Lyme disease relationships, and what he's found is that the, uh, the rodents are the last to disappear from these uh, degraded systems are things like white-footed mice, chipmunks, and short-tailed shrews, and it's those three rodent species that have the highest prevalence of the Lyme bacterium. So as the system gets degraded and there are fewer rodent species available, uh, the ticks end up feeding on rodents that have a greater chance in, in, of picking up Lyme disease and passing it on to other animals. Also, native species can cause problems with forest regeneration. You can end up with dog hair, uh, thick stands from beach sprouting uh, of American beach, or hay scented fern. Uh, the conditions are right, and there's good light with deer or bivery, uh, can dominate it. A, the ground layer. And so, if either of these conditions occur, it's going to be extremely difficult to regenerate desirable hardwood species. So. Uh, the land manager is going to have to have some type of purposeful management to try to reduce competition uh, from even native vegetation. The deer also affect habitat structure. When you look on the left photo, again, you see more of a, a parkland setting with uh, low shrubs of Japanese barberry. They're just missing layers of shrubs and saplings that should be there that are not. Uh, versus the photo on the right where you've got a, a good mix of height classes and species diversity. Uh, so that habit, change in habitat structure and composition has uh, measurable effects on other species of wildlife. Uh, for example, we go back to that same study in northern Pennsylvania at the Northeast Forest Experiment Station. They look at songbird abundance on those plots with, again, the same deer densities, 10, 20, 40, 80 per square mile. And no big surprise is that ground vegetation was removed by overbrowsing at high deer densities. The number of songbirds uh, they observed on their plots decreased significantly. And again, the same as uh, was seen for plants when investigators went back 18 years later and looked at uh, bird density in those plots with, that had chronic deer overbrowsing, there was a significant negative relationship uh, showing that plant or areas that have been overbrowsed and the plant understory affected, uh, those effects last for at least two decades. So uh, again, it, forests don't recover quickly from long-term deer overbrowsing. Forest breeding birds consequently are, are impacted, and it's the species that nest either at the ground layer or in that low shrub layer that are, have the greatest impact. Things like veeries, thrushes, rose-breasted grosbeaks. Uh, if you look at long-term breeding bird atlas data uh, from New York State, it's those ground nesters and shrub nesters that tend to show long-term decline. Whereas many of the canopy nesting species, things like titmiles, Titmice or woodbelly woodpeckers, their populations tend to be stable or increasing in some cases over that same time period. So we're seeing measurable effects at the landscape scale. Carrying capacity is a term you probably you've all heard, but I want to introduce you to some uh, parts of carrying capacity you might not have heard in the past. I think we're all familiar with biological carrying capacity. That's the number of animals that can be supported at a, at a certain habitat over a long period of time. And for strictly forest habitat, big woods habitat, like we see in the southern tier, New York, uh, northern woodlands of Pennsylvania, uh, strictly forest habitats, carrying capacity 75, 80 deer per square mile. And the woods can sustain those number of deers uh, that number of deer and that density uh, for many years. 
Uh, the problem is if we want to maintain biodiversity, the full complement of other animals and plants that might be there, uh, those densities are, uh, at carrying capacity are about 15 deer per square mile. Once you get above about 15 deer per square mile, you start to see impacts on, uh, again, sensitive wildflowers, sensitive songbird species. Cultural carrying capacity is what people are willing to tolerate on the landscape. And what I've found over many years is that most forest landowners begin to recognize there's problems in their woodland when deer densities hit about 45, 50 deer per square mile. Browse lines are becoming evident. Uh, understory hardwoods that you might want to regenerate, your oaks and maples are starting to disappear. And usually forest landowners at that point say, well, we've got too many deer on the landscape and we need to do something about it. What's interesting is that landscape matrix changes, so does carrying capacity. Uh, where you have a mix of forest and farmland, uh, farmlands have crops, a lot of them are fertilized and high in nitrogen, they're, they're good quality forage for deer, so that carrying capacity goes up to maybe 100, 125 deer per square mile where you've got a, a mix of habitats like that. And because of the farm crops, sometimes you can carry a little bit higher densities, maybe 20 deer per square mile in your woodland and still have decent biodiversity because deer are spending a lot of their time feeding on, on and around croplands. The culture carrying capacity tends to drop. Uh, a lot of farm landowners start to see significant damage to their ag crops at densities as low as 35, 40 deer per square mile. Uh, so that drops slightly from a floor setting. And then the areas where I see the absolute highest deer densities are in the urban rural fringe of our metropolitan area. Often you get a, a diversity of plants, uh, home garden plants, landscape ornamental. Many times these areas, uh, because of housing density, might be closed to hunting completely so you don't have hunting as a mortality factor. It's not unusual to see densities of 150 deer per square mile or more in some of these urban rural fringe areas. And so even though biological carrying capacity is quite high, uh, the carrying capacity for biodiversity is still low, probably around that 15 deer per square mile. Cultural carrying capacity tends to run 50, 60 deer per square mile before uh, people start to complain about too much ornamental damage, too many deer car collisions, Lyme disease concerns and issues. So again, that varies depending on landscape contacts, what carrying capacity might be and just be aware that there are different types of carrying capacity. Uh, Dave DeColasto with the Northeast Forest Experiment Station put this slide together uh, a few years back to show the relationship between uh, deer density and, and quality animals and habitat. So what I'd like to do if we uh, start here at the 10 line where Peter's got this arrow. Imagine a line going straight across the graph. So net pro productivity is the number of fawns produced per square mile. So we're here at this 10 level. So there's two levels on the carrying capacity cur curve where you can produce 10 fawns per square mile. One here at about 10 to 12 deer per square mile and a second out here at about 70 deer per square mile. On this side of the equation, or this side of the curve, deer densities are very low. Uh, you have quality deer, uh, the excellent fat reserve, big bucks with big racks. On the other side of the equation, deer in extremely poor condition. Not all the females are breeding. They're uh, at near starvation level, but you still, so the output is equal. Uh, because the animals are in such poor condition. As forest managers, as wildlife biologists, we should be managing the key deer densities on the left side of this curve, somewhere between 15, 20 deer per square, walk, square mile. So we have quality animals and quality habitat. Unfortunately, sometimes we get hunting groups that put pressure on to manage more on the, the right side of the curve uh, because they want to see a lot of deer when they hunt and go in the woods. But by the time you're up to 45 plus deer per square mile in woodland settings, uh, you've got obvious brown line, browse lines and only browse resistant species are left in the woodland at that point. It's really been fairly heavily impacted. What we're fighting is the innate capacity of deer to reproduce and uh, to create 
uh, new population. And we had, say, ideal hypothetical situation, a large fence area, no predator, unlimited food resources. And you put a bucket of dough there in year one, there were no mortality factors to worry about. By year seven, you'd have a 40 deer within that fenced enclosure. Uh, it's a 19-fold increase in seven years. And so to overcome this innate reproductive capacity in deer, and most of your adult does on decent range are going to produce twin fawns and occasional triplet, and even your yearling does often will produce a single fawn. So the bottom line is about 40% of an existing deer herd must die or go somewhere else annually just to keep the population level stable. And in many areas uh, uh, where we even have very active, very aggressive hunting program, uh, that 40% figure may not be reached, so the herds could have slowly increase over time. New York State DC uh, recognized uh, uh, this was happening in New York. Uh, this is deer hunting harvest data uh, over the long term. And uh, some of you here in the Northeast might remember the blizzard of 93 when we were decimated with 45 to 60 inches of late spring snowfall in March. That set the deer herd back in 1994. So you see that little drop in, in deer harvest. Uh, but then notice from 1994 to about 2002, there was essentially exponential growth in our deer herd in New York State. And up to about 2000 in that uh, time frame, uh, DEC was issuing more buck tags and doe tags. They saw this growth curve based on harvest data and said, well, we got to get their herd under control. So there was a number of years where they in, in, uh, issued far more antlerless tags, and you can see that population level drop down and stabilized by the, about 2005, 2006. And since then, uh, DEC has been issuing antlerless tags to keep the herd in check and not allow this uh, rapid population build up and rapid growth. Uh, so at a, at a landscape scale, hunting can do a lot of good in helping uh, uh, keep a deer population in check. But anyone who hunts deer knows deer are not equally distributed on the landscape. For example, deer densities in New York are lowest in the Adirondack ecoregion in northern New York. It's typical to have six to eight deer per square mile up in there in that part of the state. You've got mature woodlands, not a lot of timber harvesting going on on some of those lands. Uh, so uh, very severe winters with deep, persistent snow, just not ideal deer habitat. You get in the south, central, and southwestern New York, uh, we have extremely high deer populations in some areas, and some of our highest uh, county uh, and town takes are in southern and, and uh, western New York. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, Deer, dense, uh, deer harvest density is an indicator of abundance, but it's not a true measure of population level. For example, in Westchester County, extreme southeastern New York and Hudson Valley and Suffolk County on eastern Long Island, we've got extremely high deer density, but harvest rates are relatively low. Uh, the access to deer is limited. Uh, Westchester County is archery only. There's no firearms hunting because of the, the housing density and development there. So even though there are a lot of deer on the landscape, access to those animals is, is fairly restricted. So harvest tends to be much lower. And those are areas we saw on the early maps from uh, Nature Conservancy where we've got chronic deer over browsing problems in our woodlands. We all are familiar with the problems caused by deer overpopulation by far and away. Uh, the most uh, severe from economic and health and safety standpoint is deer vehicle accidents. Uh, it's estimated we hit somewhere between 70,000 and 100,000 deer a year on New York highways. Nobody really knows the actual number. There's no central database for statistics where you can pull those numbers up easily and look. Uh, we know on average, based on insurance company reporting, uh, if uh, your car hits a deer, you're probably going to have somewhere between uh, three and five thousand dollars on average in vehicle repairs. So it's a huge economic burden. We also know from the national uh, crash database that uh, about four percent of deer vehicle accidents result 
and a human injury of some type, and nationwide there are about approximately 200 uh, human fatalities from deer-related vehicle accidents. Most of those occur when people swerve to miss deer. So I tell drivers that you know, a deer runs out in front of you, you can't avoid it, hit the deer. That's the softest thing you're going to hit. When you swerve to miss a deer, that's when you get into trouble and get into oncoming traffic or go off the road and hit a tree, something much more solid. We also did a survey uh, back in 2002 of deer damage to agriculture in New York, working with Farm Bureau and New York State Ag and Markets. And at that point in time, we estimated deer caused about $59 million a year in crop losses uh, for our growers in New York State. I suspect uh, other nearby states like Pennsylvania probably have uh, similar levels or maybe even higher levels of deer damage to crops. Deer damage to uh, landscape ornamentals in the upper right, we have no recent data on this. Uh, but when we looked across the estimates from northeastern states, uh, back in 2005, I think it was, it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year in the Northeast. Deer damage the forest regeneration on the lower right. You can see the repeated browsing on these stump sprouts. They're not going anywhere. Uh, we'll talk about that today. We've talked about impacts to birds and biodiversity and some of the tick deer relationships. So what can we do? What do we have in the deer management toolbox? If you're not going to control deer abundance, then you're sort of in the realm of damage control, uh, putting on repellents on sensitive plant materials around uh, your home garden will do some good for a limited time frame. Fencing to exclude deer from gardens or agricultural crops are effective but costly. I want to emphasize feeding uh, deer is illegal in New York State. Uh, anyone that's feeding deer within 300 feet of a public highway can be ticketed for that. That's been in the environmental conservation law for many years. So if we move to the right half and look at population control, a lot of people, particularly urban suburban landowners, want to promote uh, non-lethal methods, habitat alterations, a non-starter. Uh, we're not going to change our landscape. We've got forest, we've got ag, we've got urban sprawl. Uh, there's nothing we can do in terms of altering habitat that's going to change deer abundance other than put concrete everywhere. Capture and relocation is a non-starter. Most areas in New York State are at or above goal density. It's difficult and expensive to trap deer. You've got to worry about capture myopathy during transport. Some of those animals will die if you try to do it. And so uh, our state wildlife agents have made the decision that they're not going to issue a permit to do that. So that's not viable. And then finally, fertility control. Uh, sometimes you'll hear certain stakeholder groups talk about uh, using immunocontraception, which is a transient form of uh, uh, birth control, um, a contraceptive vaccine, or surgical sterilization, which is a permanent uh, control of reproduction. All these things are considered experimental in New York. To do it, you need to have a research permit issued by the state wildlife agency. So really, none of these things are really quite at the management level yet. If we look at lethal methods. Again, some will call for a predator reintroduction. I don't think most homeowners would like to see a mountain lion or a black bear in their backyard or even, even a coyote for that matter. So predator reintroduction, again, is a, a non-starter in most cases. Capture and kill, bait and shoot can be effective uh, for small areas or individual property. But both of these techniques tend to be very controversial. Some people just don't want to see deer killed. And it usually takes quite a public process to get approval to move ahead for that. And it'll take a special uh, uh, deer damage permit from DEC in order to do that. Traditional hunting is our best tool uh, to use and uh, actually the only tool that's practical at large scale, the landscape scale areas. Controlled hunting can enhance the uh, hunting success in some situations. And I even put commercial hunting up here with question marks. There are some professionals, uh, wildlifers now, they're starting to talk about with the high overabundance of deer in urban areas, a lot of these animals not accessible to regular sport hunting. Uh, is there a way to commercialize that? I don't see it happening anytime soon because it's going to take changes in both state and federal legislation and laws in order to make that viable. Right now, it's not legal to uh, commercially sell uh, wildlife that's been harvested. Scales for deer management vary, and so what's effective can uh, 
vary greatly depending on scale. There are things that work at the individual property level that may or may not work at all at a community or landscape scale, and vice versa. For example, hunting is a great tool at the landscape scale, uh, but if you live in a community where there's a local ordinance that doesn't allow discharge of firearm, it's not something that you can use, so you've got to look at other ways to manage uh, deer impacts. New York State laws and regulations are mostly designed to manage deer at the, the town, wildlife management unit, or state scale. Things like doe tags, DMPs, uh, antlerless only special seasons, extended seasons, all these type of hunting uh, approaches uh, can work relatively well at large spatial scales, but they may or may not do much on any given neighborhood or specific property. At the other extreme, you have things like DMAP, Deer Management Assistance Program Permits, or DDPs, Deer Damage Permits, uh, that are designed to work at a more localized level, individual property level. Uh, deer Management Assistance Program or additional antlerless tags that our state wildlife agency issues to landowners uh, is to reduce deer numbers during the open hunting season. So the landowner applies, gets X number of tags, and then can invite hunters on their properties to take antlerless deer. Deer damage permits are designed for deer management and control outside the normal hunting season. So let's say that you're a, a strawberry grower and here it's June, it's the peak of strawberry season. You've got deer coming onto your farm just as mating your strawberries at night. Uh, a grower could apply right now and get a damage permit to shoot limited numbers of deer to protect the crop on their farm. So again, uh, DEC has a fair amount of latitude on writing damage permits, and things can be done on damage permits that you can't do uh, during a normal hunting season. We'll discuss that a bit more later. I want to emphasize, as a forest landowner, you have control of hunting on your property. You can tailor it to meet your need, put restrictions on who, when, where, and how they hunt. What type of, what's the age and sex and number of deer to be taken from your property? Uh, some private landowners have marksmanship requirements. Usually these are the, the bigger programs with multiple hunters. Uh, but any program you do has got to also follow local town and village discharge ordinance. So again, before you dive in, talk with your regional uh, DEC wildlife folks and make sure you're in compliance with any local town laws or regulations that might be on the books. Deer exclusion is possible. Uh, eight foot high barrier fences are extremely effective at protecting large areas from deer damage. There's individual protection, things like tree tubes that, and different types of guards, or even uh, netting around the base of trees to uh, protect them from deer. Uh, electric fences have been used more in an egg setting than in a, a woodland setting, as have dogs and invisible fences. Uh, been used in ag settings in Christmas tree farms with some decent results, and we're conducting some experimentation uh, with slash right now uh, on and around Cornell. Slash is the the tops that are left over after a timber harvest, and if you get enough density of tops and felled in the right direction, uh, they can provide areas where it's difficult for deer to walk through and reach seedlings so they can provide uh, some protection for seedlings and new growth. And uh, there's an experiment underway near campus looking at, well, what density is slack, what size woody debris do you need to leave to get the, uh, the longest term effects and, and protection uh, for your regeneration. Repellents are mostly used for in and around the home and landscape situation. Even when you get into agriculture, usually so much area needs to be treated that repellents come, become impractical pretty quickly. We tested a number of products over the year, and consistently what we found is those deer repellents that have uh, rotten egg, putrescent egg solids is the actual ingredient, tend to have the best deer repellents. Things like big game repellent, uh, deer off, now bone-eyed rabbit deer repellent has a, uh, those type of products uh, tend to work relatively well for short-term protection. We, we test the product by spraying Japanese use indoors in a large uh, uh, barn facility, letting the material dry, and then taking them out and putting them in the field in uh, people's backyards where we know there's relatively high deer densities take a photograph of a plant 
weekly, and with that grid system behind the plant, I can calculate the surface area of foliage or leaf area uh, that that plant has. And as an example, this is one of our control or untreated Japanese ewes in the field after two weeks uh, in late January. And you can see the, the deer have removed about 60% of the plant surface area. They're just stubs about the diameter of my thumb that are left. So it gives us a really good test of how well different repellents work and stack up. And so the last repellent trial we did, uh, we found that the products, again, that had rotten egg, a uh, big game repellent, the mix in the spray, deer off and deer stopper, and this uh, experiment all had rotten egg as the primary active ingredient. We saw no damage to the Japanese U on those plants for four weeks. Uh, efficacy started to drop by week six, and then by eight weeks out, two months out, uh, essentially they weren't any different to control. So the take home message is here, even the best deer repellents uh, fail relatively quickly after five to six weeks or so when deer are hungry. So if you want to continue to use repellents to keep deer away from plant material, you got to be able to retreat every five weeks or so. And that's just not possible here in upstate New York during the winter months. Too much cold, ice and snow. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done uh, the last uh, nine years on the Cornell campus. Uh, we suffer deer-related impacts on campus just as any local community would. Relatively high deer densities impacts to our what we call our outdoor classrooms, our egg fields, our woodlots, our natural areas, our arboretum. And so we decided to combine surgical sterilization on an experimental basis with an intensive controlled hunting program. So the blue area on the graph is the sterilization zone. That's central campus. It's almost two square miles where you're not allowed to carry a, a firearm or a bow unless you're a police officer. That area will, will never be hunted, yet we've got a fair number of deer in that two square miles. And the red areas are other Cornell-owned properties, again, these woodlots ag fields, natural area where we've got high deer density, but we've got area that's uh, suitable for hunting, and many of those properties have been hunted for years. So we developed a very uh, uh, strong controlled hunting program on that, about 3,000 acres of land that's in red to the east and north of campus, trying to cut off deer immigration into our uh, sterilization zone. So on core campus, 1,100 acres, we did our fertility control research. Uh, we fenced sensitive plots, like in the lower right, our Monday wildflower garden on campus. is five acres surrounded by a deer-proof fence. Uh, plant materials in our arboretum, sensitive plants are surrounded by netting uh, and repellents uh, there to protect the plant materials. Deer were captured on campus with a variety of techniques and taken to a large animal surgery at the uh, Cornell Research Hospital. Uh, we had student veterinarians there, resident veterinarians that did essentially space surgeries on, on female deer. And then we took it back out and released it in the wild to look at uh, production, habitats, movement, survival, those type of things. Between 2007 and 2013, we did 93 surgeries and had 90 to 95% of the female deer on campus sterilized deer tag and the adult does collared. We had 77 adult does and 16 fawn, female fawns we did surgery on. And for comparison, we had 26 control adult does that were marked and unsterilized in a community just north and south of campus so we could compare fawning rates. Uh, no big surprise uh, during that six-year time span. If you're an urban deer, the two most likely causes of mortality are either running in front of a vehicle. We had 32 deer die in vehicle accidents, and another 36 wandered in the huntable areas adjacent to campus and were taken as part of the controlled hunting program. We did a really good job of removing deer with our controlled hunting. We had a earn a buck program for the early years. We required all of our hunters to take two female deers before we get our permit to kill a buck. Uh, so that was in place through 2012. And as you can see, uh, between 2008, our pilot hunting season, 
under the Controlled Hunt Program in 2014, we removed 772 deer from around campus as part of our hunting program. And although that seems like a lot of deer, it had absolutely no impact on deer population levels on campus. And I'll show you some data in just a couple of moments. In terms of harvest results, just to give some background, 2008 was our pilot year with a controlled hunt program. We had about 100 hunters in the program that year. Uh, because hunters were trying to become buck eligible, they take their two does. We only had six bucks harvested on the entire 3,000 acres of campus land. And the average number of hours hunted per deer harvested was 49, and 38% of our hunters hunters were successful. So the word got out that hunting is great on and around Cornell. Our number of hunters who applied and actually hunted jumped up to about 200 hunters during 2009 through 2011. Our percent of successful hunters dropped and stabilized around 25 to 28 percent of our hunters successful. And the number of hours hunted per deer kill increased to about 50 to 60 hours per deer kill. 2012, things changed drastically. Uh, DEC implemented the deer management focus area in Tompkins County, which included most of the land in our hunting program. Uh, the, with the deer management focus area, there was unlimited antlerless tags for the entire deer hunting season. Each hunter could apply online and kill two antlerless deer per day for the entire season. Plus, there was a special uh, three weeks additional antlerless deer hunting in the month of January on and around campus. And you can see the number of hunters that actually hunted swelled up about 500, almost 600 hunters hunting some years. Uh, the number of hours per deer killed jumped up to over 80 hours per deer harvested and our success rate dropped to below 20%. Putting more hunters in the woods doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take more deer. You're better to hunt better off to have a small number of very skilled individuals who know how to hunt and who know the land, and you can be much more effective than just blanking the woods with, with people who don't know the landscape and really what they're doing in some cases. To estimate deer abundance, we did an infrared triggered camera survey. These are just trail cams we put out over bait under our research permit. Uh, because we had a very high number of tagged deer and collared deer on campus, deer would come into the bait stations, take their own pictures, and then we could do a uh, mark recapture computer simulation to uh, get actual estimates of abundance with very good precision. One of the things we noticed as we collected camera data is that deer numbers weren't dropping over the years. And we started to scratch our head. We shot hundreds of animals. We sterilized all these females. Why was our population staying level? So each year for our camera survey during the week we run the camera, we usually get 2,000 or more photos of deer. So we went in and from 20, 2009 to 2012 and pulled 500 photos at random from our data set and just look at the images, what's there, buck, doe, fawn, just to get a, a rough sense of what's going on. And what we found fairly quickly is the fawn numbers drop very quickly. We hit that 95% sterilized, sterilized threshold in 2011. And you can see very few fawns in the images. And a lot of those are repeat photographs of the same individual. Doe numbers were coming down nicely from almost 500 does on pictures down to around 300. But the buck numbers increased dramatically. And what we realized in 2012 was that our veterinary surgeons at the hospital were concerned about hormone status in deer. And they did the bulk of our surgeries with tubal ligation. And with tubal ligation, deer continue to cycle. And so in a normal, uh, herd where deer become pregnant, essentially all the does that are going to breed for the most part are bred and pregnant by the end of December. Well, our deer, they were the bucks were mounting and trying to breed with them, but they weren't becoming pregnant. And they continued to estrus cycle in the January, February, and some of them in the early March. And so we had the only does and estrus in late winter uh, in Tompkins County. And the bucks quickly figured that out. And it, uh, really negated everything that we did on the female side. 
So I can graph that out. You can see the fawn number dropping dramatically following their sterilization surgery, does coming down nicely, and the bucks balancing the whole thing out and us having really no effect at all on our impact indicators. In fact, when we looked at deer vehicle collision rates over that time period, the trend is not good. Actually, numbers are up, even though uh, we had uh, fewer fawns and fewer does on the landscape. Total number of acts, vehicle accidents on campus didn't change. In addition, Dr. Baron Blasi, who's one of our plant ecologists, came in and did an oak sentinel seedling project. He'd go out in our native woodlands on campus and plant oaks in pairs of 20, and one member of the, of the pair would be caged, so it protected from deer, and the other oak would be tagged and unprotected. And he did this uh, survey for several years in woodlots all around campus. He raised uh, the oak seedlings in a greenhouse. They're very easy to raise and very consistent and uh, successful with planting those on our lands. And what we found is during that same time frame where we were doing the hunting and sterilization is that our oak sentinel seedlings had extremely poor survivorship. Usually, you know, 70, 80 percent of them were gone uh, because of herbivory within 90 days after planting. So within our own woodlots, we're still not regenerating oak, we're not regenerating maple, and impacting biodiversity. So at this point, we sort of scratched our heads and say, we got to do something different. We're not getting anywhere near reaching our goal densities, what we want to do on campus. So we applied for a, a deer damage permit with DEC, and that damage permit is for antlerless deer only. It provides us access to deer in areas that can't be hunted. We hand-picked about a dozen shooters and put them through a shooting proficiency test. Uh, with a damage permit, we can use corn bait to attract deer into safe shooting zones, and Cornell Police approved all of our, our tree stands and our shooting sites. And we can also use lights for shooting uh, deer with archery equipment until 11 p.m. Campus police approved uh, both uh, compound bows and crossbows on campus. We still have to follow all the environmental conservation laws and discharge distances. And each year, the first two years, uh, the DEC regional office issued us 40 antlers tags for uh, use on campus. And at the end of uh, the damage permit period, we have to file a report and turn in any unused tags. During the first year we tried this, 2013-14, we took 34 deer, most of them at night. And the second year, 2014-2015, uh, we took an additional 37 deer off a of, uh, core campus area. And what's dramatic is when you look at our camera survey data, you can see between 2009 and 2013, despite all the hunting, despite sterilizing 95% of our doe, our deer herd was actually slowly enlarging and, and creeping upward. But those first two years of, of using the damage permit, uh, we cut deer numbers on campus about in half. And so the question is, how low can we get it? Our goal density on campus would be to have 20 deer or less, and so we're still a ways from that, that goal density we'd like to achieve. What do we recommend based on uh, what we've learned over the last few years? Uh, if you're going to do deer management, you've got to develop some type of an assessment program so you can determine if what you're doing is, is working or not. Some way of measuring regeneration or forest vegetation, and we'll talk about the AVID protocol in just a few minutes as one potential way to do that. Avoid non-lethal methods. You'll get animal welfare groups that will push hard and make arguments for these non-lethal methods, but they've shown really little promise in areas where deer can move freely on the landscape. You might need to develop local expertise on deer management. Most of the types of things we're doing on campus now well exceeds the capability of the average hunter in the woods. Uh, community support is essential for maintaining a program, and once you start deer management, you need to plan for the long haul. You can put a great program in place, but if you don't uh, have a good plan on how you're going to continue that over 10 years, 15 years. Uh, I don't want to see folks wasting a lot of time starting something then dropping it. I want to briefly talk about our Deer Forest Impacts Project in New York State. 
Cornell Cooperative Extension staff will be conducting workshops to aid landowners with identifying and reducing gear impacts to regeneration. Uh, this is a collaborative project between DEC, faculty at SUNY ESF, and also at the University of Georgia. Uh, the University of Georgia IT folks are developing a phone app to input uh, data on impacts of deer to your woodland, and we're going to collect that in a central database so we could start to map out and get maybe a finer scale uh, distribution of where deer impacts are occurring. Uh, in 2015, we developed the first version of AVID in uh, paper data form. Uh, we're hoping by mid to late July, uh, the beta version of the phone app will be available. We could test that this summer. If you want to see more info about our project or get a copy of the AVID impact protocol, uh, go to my wildlifecontrol.info website and look under the research tab for deer forest impact project. AVID is our vegetation protocol we developed. It stands for assessing vegetation impacts of deer and it's designed to be a relatively rapid and repeatable method for getting a handle on deer impacts to the forest vegetation. It, uh, means that a landowner would need to go out and set up uh, six uh, small plots in their woodland, uh, mark a few preferred wildflowers and tree seedlings, and then uh, sample those annually and follow things over time to see whether or not they're seeing an improvement in uh, vegetation response if they're doing deer management on their property. With that, that's uh, all I wanted to cover, Pete, so I think we can open it up for questions. I think you're monitoring the chat, so if you've got some questions, I'd be glad to try to address those. Great. Thank you, Paul. This was another very good presentation, so I appreciate that. I'm not surprised, but certainly I appreciate it. Um, so this is a time if you all have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat pod, please. Type them so that they are sent to all participants, and then that way everybody can see the questions. And I'll I'll be reading those questions to Paul, um, so that uh, so that he can just focus on answering. So I'm going to lead with a question. And actually, I had this question at lunch, and I didn't ask it. You know, you went through all of the the, the efforts um, that you described on campus to try to control the deer herd. And they were, I mean, I was kind of watching it from the periphery and you you summarized it tonight. You you and others put a huge amount of work and money into um, trying to regulate the deer herd on campus. And you had um, you had reasonably good conditions. You had, you know, lots of, you know, DEC support in terms of of tags and you know preferential treatment, let's say, in terms of deer depredation permits or deer damage permits, and you know special weapons and night hunting, and you know the whole Cornell Vet School surgical team. I mean, there's a ton, and you struggled to get the deer in check. What, what does that say for those of us who are out, kind of in the woods? Um, you know, what are, <laughs> I guess I'm kind of saying I don't feel very optimistic and, and that's coming from an optimist. So what, how, how, what's our, what's our forecast? Well, let's say I'm uh, much less optimistic than I was 10 years ago when I started uh, the deer project on campus. At that point in time, I thought we could had, get real headway if we could get 90% of the deer sterilized and have the intensive hunting program that we'd make a difference. But unfortunately, that did wasn't the case. What I've seen from reading the literature is that most uh, areas where there is intensive hunting, controlled hunting program, uh, about the lowest density I've seen published uh, that folks get to is around 40, 45 deer per square mile using regular uh, recreational hunters as a tool. And, and uh, that's about what we found on campus. I mean, we weren't really having any impact at all with our recreational hunting program, just a marginal impact. And it took uh, the deer damage permit to make real change. And so for the average person with a small woodlot, it's not going to be easy. You've really got to uh, 
have your hunters focusing on does, focusing intently on does. And that over continued times, Pete, you know from when we started the controlled hunting program at the Iron it took eight to ten years of very intensive hunting to knock deer back out of our are not teaching and research for it. And that's, I think, what we're up against on any given property uh, is that it's going to take years of concerted effort to get deer densities down where they're low. And the problem with that is that uh, then it gets really hard to hunt those areas because instead of going out and maybe seeing six or seven deer a day during a normal hunt day, you might go out and see one deer every two or three days when deer densities are down to the point where they need to be to get uh, forest regeneration. And that makes uh, hunters uh, very unhappy. And uh, a lot of folks will give up and go somewhere else where it's much easier to kill a deer. And uh, so it's, it's going to be a challenge. There's, there's no way around that. And you've got to have a long-term plan in mind and, and be very intent about what you want to do and accomplish it. So, um, so sport hunting, you know, by itself, or even sport hunting on steroids isn't going to do it. And so, are you know, are there, and we talked about this a little bit at, uh, at the lunch session, I'll, I'll be surprised if somebody doesn't ask him, but what about market hunting? What's, what would it take to, you know, what, why not have market hunting? Okay, market hunting is right now being discussed by a number of wildlife professionals, but there are a number of laws and regulations, both at the state and federal level, uh, that prohibit sale of meat from uh, harvested game animals, and those laws would have to change. I really uh, don't see that changing in the immediate future. I could be wrong, given enough political pressure, but uh, usually when hunting legislation comes forward, especially liberalizing things, that uh, you get enough stakeholders that are opposed to that, that it's really difficult to make those uh, changes in laws and regulations. But if the Lyme disease gets bad enough, enough people can complain in, uh, in a state, then you might see movement. I know there was a, a bill proposed that would have allowed experimental commercial hunting for overabundant deer in New Jersey, but I don't don't think that went anywhere last year. So that's, again, there's some been some draft legislation. It's, it'll take a matter of time to, to see if any of that's successful. Okay, and I'm gonna. I hope the audience continues to type in questions. I want to. I want to play this line of questioning out a little bit more. Um, so let's say we change. And I, I, you know, I, um, my mind's always spinning, not always in you know, coherent direction. But it's, so I think about you know, what if we were changing absolutely change some of the um, the the the, poli the hunting policies. Let's say that we uh, made it so that you could go out and you could shoot a doe any time of the year, you know, just like so still traditional hunting per se, but you could shoot a doe any time of the year, kind of like a woodchuck, and you would have to compete under a lottery system for uh, the right to, to draw a buck tag. And there might be, you know, it might be based on the number of does that you shot or it's just a straight up lottery. What would, so that might arguably have some impact on the doe population, but what would that do to the hunter's attitudes? I mean, would, would hunters look at that and say, there's not as many deer, I'm just going to give up hunting, and I'm going to take up bowling instead. So what's, I mean, from a kind of a human perspective, what, what happens if there are drastic landscape-wide or regional changes in, in the, uh, in the, availability of deer. Yeah, I, th I think if you had those drastic changes, uh, recreational hunting might be able to do something, but I think you're going to find uh, most sportsmen's groups strongly opposed to that, as many will probably strongly oppose commercial hunting too. Um, I personally wouldn't support hunting uh, during the summer months uh, when does are having fawns and you've got fawns that could be orphaned and probably uh, many hunters would oppose that. But even if, say, you could run a season from late August when fawns are independent to uh, late April before does give birth and have, you know, an eight, nine month deer season, yeah, then at that point uh, you might be able to remove enough animals from the landscape. But I think from 
most of the human dimension surveys I've seen, imagine the amount of time someone would have to spend in the woods. And most hunting families only want one or two deer. And if you can fill your two deer tags in October, November, while it's still above freezing and there's not two feet of snow on the ground, guess what? They're going to fill their two deer tags, freezes full, I'm done for the year. And that's one of the biggest challenges we see with our deer damage permit. We're out there in uh, February and March on some of these areas, and it's 10 degrees out with a 10 mile an hour wind and two feet of snow on the ground. It gets really cold sitting out there at 10, a, 10 p.m. at night, hopefully, <laughs> waiting to see a deer come by. It's pretty miserable, and not a lot of folks would do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Point well made. All right, so Tim Levitich says he wants to regenerate high-value timber species. Uh, it sounds like fencing is his only option, but it's expensive. Are there cost-sharing programs for such fencing? Uh, Pete, New York State DEC, I know, doesn't have any cost-sharing program. I don't know what might be available through some of the forest landowner incentive programs. Do you? So I th I'm pretty sure that the NRCS through EQIP has funding available for, they don't have it for fencing per se, but they have it to regenerate high-value tree species. Um, it's like a, a, a word. Uh, nuance that they have to uh, take in order to um, meet federal statute, but effectively it provides cost sharing for fencing. That's the good news. The bad news is there's not very much of it statewide, and so the the option to get, um, you know, the probability of getting uh, accepted for cost sharing is relatively low. But the New York Forest Owners Association has been very active in working with a uh, coalition of other organizations in support of uh, trying to develop state level funding that would be, I think, would be administered through the DEC, but state level funding to cost share uh, fencing. So uh, currently there are limited options, but there is um, a lot of hope and a lot of energy for the future. Yeah, Pete, I might comment, the state of Wisconsin years ago added a $5 fee on all big game licenses, and that generates hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that goes into a pool. And I know at least farm landowners in uh, uh, Wisconsin that are suffering high deer damage can apply to the state and get money directed uh, for fencing to protect their agricultural crops. I know many of the northeastern states have not wanted to get involved in these type of compensation programs, but the, but they have worked in other parts of the country. I, last time I looked, I think about 28 or 30 states across the country had some type of compensation program for uh, protecting crops from deer and other wildlife. Uh, just usually uh, northeastern states uh, tend to not have done that. And, and, and that's um, – that. Uh, and that's a compensation program based on an, an additive fee to the hunting license. That's right. So hunters wow. are bearing the, uh, the burden of the cost for the fencing program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, next question. Um, David says, do you believe that authorizing the use of more efficient hunting implements on a landscape scale would lead to fewer deer in the in the residential or, or urban areas. In other words, if center fire rifles were allowed it to be used in all of Onondaga County, would that lead to lower deer density in the urban areas? So essentially, would it be a, a reverse pull of deer out of those urban areas if, you, if those uh, more efficient weapons were used in the, in the rural areas? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and my uh, response to that is, uh, that's sort of just tweaking with the regulations. It's not a big enough change. Uh, my gut feeling is it have limited or, or no impact at all. And the reason for this response is that what really limits deer take is access to deer, uh, particularly on private land. And it's not so much the implements. We've got very effective implements available now. It's getting access to private lands uh, where deer have refuges. And you know the typical urban area, suburban area, where you might have woodlots and housing developments. Uh, with uh, 
say the 100, even the 150 foot discharge for a uh, compound bow that limits how close you can get the building. And you get a couple of people posting their land and then all of a sudden you've got uh, several acres uh, that deer have as a refuge. So it's not so much the implement, it's the access to the deer. Somehow we've got to improve landowner relation, get people more accepting of hunting and get access to those deer now that are essentially uh, non-huntable on private lands. So, uh, so let's let's broaden that question out maybe a little bit, Paul. If the, uh, you know, if if however it happened, let's say there was a greater, you double the harvest of deer in the rural areas of Onondaga County. Would that would that draw deer away from the residential areas, or would the deer in the residential areas say, uh, nobody shoots at us here. We have lots of you know, hostas to eat, so why would we want to go out and, you know, and live in the woods again? And one thing to understand about deer behavior, deer don't behave like gas molecule. For example, if you have a low gas pressure in one area and a high gas pressure somewhere else, it'll distribute itself and sort of even out if you, if you, uh, if it can over time. Deer uh, have a matriarchal society. The adult females are the key, and those adult females are extremely fixed on the landscape. The average home range size for an adult female deer we see around Ithaca averages about 150 acres, maybe up to 175 acres, and the core area that range that that female deer uses day in and day out. It's as small as 30 acres on average. So they don't move a whole lot. And just because you reduce density drastically in one area, a uh, half mile away or a mile away, those deer that have established home ranges aren't just going to wander over there. They're going to stay in their home range because that's where they grew up. That's what they know. And so, yes, you'll see some dispersal of deer uh, from high population areas to low population areas, but for those deer that have established home ranges, they're not going anywhere. They're probably going to stay in their home range for their life. We've got a few deer on campus that, you know, I tagged back in uh, 2004, I think it was, and uh, they're still alive and kicking at 12, 13 years old in the same home range as they were when I tagged them as fawns and yearlings. Okay, um, I, I like the gas molecule example. That helps me think through it a little bit better. Um, so Rod says he's interested. He likes liked seeing the information about the success with night hunting to reduce populations in the deer in the Cornell area of campus. Um, he's wondering if DEC is looking at options. So I'm, not, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. And Rod, uh, hopefully, is still here and can clarify it if I miss it. So he's wondering if the DEC is looking at options to use night hunting along in trail areas. I'm assuming that's along deer trails, but it, maybe it's along uh, hiking trails, probably deer trails. See if this will reduce deer numbers um, in high density areas, kind of targeting night hunting, um, or uh, if there's you know a future option where maybe uh, hunting is allowed after dark. Um, uh, the answer to that question is simply no. Uh, hunting is not permitted for deer under dark under after dark under environmental conservation law. So I want to make it clear what we do on a deer damage permit is deer control. It's not deer hunting. Yes, we may be using archery equipment, which is a deer hunting implement, but the goal is not recreation in any way. It's removing deer from the landscape as quickly and efficiently as possible. So DEC is allowed to write in things like the baiting and the night lighting and a damage permit that's not legal uh, during normal recreational hunting, and that's not going to change. Okay, so so even on a on a deer control permit or a deer damage permit. It's not it's not um, default that you can hunt after dark or over bait. Those have to be those are specific. Those details are specific to each individual permit. Is that correct? That's correct. And each individual permit it may vary on when and how and what can be used. For example, on our agriculture deer damage permit we have on campus, uh, 
because we're in an area where it's more remote and there's safe shooting zone, DEC allows us to use high powered rifle on a damage permit to take deer off of cropland where they're causing excessive damage to our research plots. But under normal hunting, rifles not permitted in Tompkins County. It's not a legal implement. So again, that damage permit gives you lots of flexibility to do things that you can't do during a regular hunting season. All right. So do they ever allow aircraft as part of those deer damage permits? Uh, only for census, not for animal <laughs> control. Okay. I was joking on that. All right. Okay. On with the question. So Suzanne wants to know, uh, essentially, the, the question is, why doesn't the automobile industry, insurance industry, the insurance group, get more involved in this? I mean, they're, you know, they're they're insuring motor. You know, every motorist has to have insurance at some level, and the volume of of accidents and the total economic cost is staggering. So, why don't they have a, a big? Why aren't they playing a bigger role? Now we've had that discussion for a couple of decades and I've worked some with the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety you know, just you know, discussing what's possible and what they're doing and when you start looking at the economics it's just far easier for them to write a few additional dollars in someone's policy and balance the cost over hundreds of thousands of users versus trying to spend money on solving you know, more local site-specific problems. So it comes down to economic. It's just easier to, to pass that cost on to consumers, unfortunately. So, so the consumers are the ones that are going to need to, but I don't know what consumers are going to tell the insurance companies, you know. No, the consumers about. aren't going to tell the insurance companies anything. If they want changes in deer vehicle accidents, they're going to have to uh, work with elected officials and legislatures and stuff to pass legislation that will get at uh, deer overabundance issues. Okay, and that's a, a perfect segue into the next question by Chris and Peters. Hi, Chris. Glad you could join us. Um, he's uh, studied literature on deer over the last year, and he's worked in a broad area of New York. Um, and is, he's located down in that very high deer density area in the lower Catskills and lower Hudson. Uh, worked on deer control projects with some success, um, but he's noted, you know, that the fencing is expensive uh, to install and also to maintain. Uh, it doesn't see a foreseeable end to the deer issue without policy change and social change. There may be some options or strategies, rather, to, uh, to, to implement local controlled hunting so that you can eliminate the family group, the deer family group. Um, but that seems to buck up against socialist issues remove, uh, associated with removing, you know, a, a high concentration removal from a small area. So. I think the real question is, how do we deal with the social dimensions of deer? Uh, that's that's, I, and I believe I believe that's the human social dimension, not the deer social dimension. Yeah, and, the, and that's the most difficult part, particularly in community-based deer management. The, the deer biology is relatively simple and straightforward. It's getting enough public support, enough stakeholders on board to allow you to do what needs to be done. And no matter where you go, that's going to be an issue, whether you're in a forest woodland or uh, in your backyard in suburbia somewhere where deer are overabundant. And given uh, the input that we all have in a deer management decision, hunters, non-hunters, animal welfare, animal rights folks, uh, you know, everybody has a say in managing our deer. And it's hard to get everybody to come to agreement on what should be done and how to go about it. Even groups that have very strong different beliefs can agree that there may be too many deer, but trying to solve that problem usually creates a lot of uh, turmoil within a, in a community. And, and coming up with viable solutions is extremely difficult. Okay. <laughs> That's not very encouraging, Paul. Yeah, it's not encouraging at all. I've gone through about three or four of these. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my. So, all right. Well, we're um, about quarter after the hour, so I wanted and the questions have stopped, so that's really why we're stopping. But I want to take this opportunity to, to thank Paul again. Paul did a fabulous job with the presentation and a, has such a thorough, deep knowledge of, 
of the subject that you know can respond to these far-ranging questions. So I, I appreciate that very much, um, and I want to thank the participants. Those were some outstanding questions. You know, it's 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 great to have thoughtful, long, detailed questions that. Um, that develop into a conversation, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to call this to a close, and thank you, Paul, and thank all of you. I hope you have a all have a great evening and a great start to your summer. So okay. thanks for hosting, Pete, and I hope this information was useful for the participants. Well, we have we have one that sent us a, a note there that said his his knowledge on this issue doubled in the last hour. So that's that's a pretty good indication. All right, thank you, all right. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.